Welcome to Combat Theory Presents, a bi-weekly podcast about all things martial arts, fight science, and combat sports. I'm your host, Paul, the evil Professor Antonelli, and our latest episode starts right now. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Combat Theory Podcast. This is Paul, and of course, today I'm joined by my good friend, Rich Grendel. How are you today, Rich? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Paul. Welcome back, dude. It's nice to be back in here. I feel like it's been a, it has been a significantly long time since we've done a podcast together, and I'm going to actually look on my phone because I wrote this down, but then I completely failed at it. The last time you and I sat on a recorded an episode was April 6th of 2022. Oh, wow. Yeah. So a lot has changed. Uh, a lot is going on. And uh, I thought we could sit down and kind of, let's say, revamp the podcast. You know, I did a couple episodes like in August of last year, um, but they were kind of like all over the place. And I even I did a um, a podcast episode with my good friend, uh, Joe um, Pinnafel, you know, who that is. Oh, yeah. And I never published it. Like I was like, oh, I'm gonna publish it next week, and then I, I was gonna say I've listened to all of them. Yeah, I, I never, I never published. It's such a I good episode it. too. But then I felt weird because like he was talking about like his next competition, like he was fighting again. He was talking, giving me all the details of the fight and everything. It would have been a great episode. And then I like, you know, life's what happens when you're busy, you know. And I um, failed to post it, mm-hmm. so then I felt weird because I was like, I don't know if I should post it. So maybe at the end of this season, I'll do like a bonus episode. So then by then it'll be like three years old. <laughs> And people will be like, this makes this that doesn't make any sense in context. So. At that point, Joe's going to be a legend. Everyone will know his name. It'll be worse. Joe will be like a, a multimillionaire that's retired. <laughs> and he'll be like, I don't remember. He probably doesn't remember. He, either that or he's sitting around wondering, like, is, he, is this jerk Does ever Paul gonna, hate me? What, why, what did I do wrong, dude? Um, so, you know, we're kind of revamping the show. And I think one of the things that when I, when I initially intended to create the podcast, it really, it was like an educational tool, right? Because I think you've said this before. Um, there's a lot of podcasts that are like informative, but more on the like entertainment side, or like, this is what your favorite fighter athlete is doing right now. But there's not a lot of podcasts that are like the conversations that coaches have or the conversations that, you know, officials have, um, or the conversations that promoters have. So I think it's an opportunity for everybody to learn a lot. Um, not just like coaches and, you know, like the officials, but also for anyone that is in, enjoys the sport of martial arts. Um, but also from a, like a teaching instructional kind of perspective. Yeah, for sure. I, I think, uh, one term that gets used a lot is a martial arts industry. Sure. And I think, a lot of podcasts and such, they kind of focus on the entertainment. Yeah. Which is a big part of it. You don't have the industry without the entertainment. Of course. Um, but we don't really get to cover a lot of the behind the scenes things. Yeah. Um, especially with coaching, especially with uh promotions and events and stuff like that. Uh athletic development. Yeah. We don't get a lot of that like in depth talk. So I thought it'd be cool if we kinda integrated that a lot more into the podcast for sure for sure but so that's kind of the idea you know like it's it's going to be um coaching and educational and like the thing the conversations that we often have but we don't really have them in public we have them a lot of times like behind the scenes for whatever reason you know um but yeah it's exciting to be back man it's been it has been far too long since I've done an episode. A um, couple of just some like you know basic things that I should probably say before we get started. Um, first off, you know the plan is that we're probably going to try to do two episodes a month, right? So um, probably like the first and third Tuesday of the month. You know, don't don't crucify me if I miss one of those weeks. But the goal is for us to actually put out pretty significant um, dates. Yeah, we've updated our website, so the Combat Theory website is going to be updated. Um, so take a look there and you can see like our cool, like combat theory shirts and like some of the other events that we're having and then pretty much everything we're going to talk about, we'll have some links on there as well. So if you're, um, you know, we're going to directly, you know, in the show notes for today, we'll directly link all the stuff we talk about, but like for whatever reason, if, you know, if you're having trouble finding Rich's website, for example, um, you could always go to just combat theory.com and it'll be on the links there as well. Um, makes sense. Cool. I think I've done all of the homework that I need to do right now. (laughs) Um, If you buy one of our shirts, it helps me with my obsession, which is uh, buying equipment that I rarely ever use. So I have that going for me, and that's super nice. It's an expensive sport. 
Yeah, being, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Any any avenue of the sport. That yeah, you no matter yeah. where, which side you think you're heading in, there'll be no money, <laughs> but there'll be lots of spending. Um, so, Rich, what have you been up to? Um, mostly just uh, promoting for the IKF, PMT, PKB. Um, I've also been coaching. I'm always coaching, even though I only have like one student now. I I'm constantly working on my curriculum, trying to improve myself as a, an instructor, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, I, I think that's like... I've been judging a lot more. Judging. On, on the martial arts side. I've been sure. judging uh, more consistently. Uh, been a, I've applied for the professional judge's license yeah. and working towards getting that. Let's see if we can move your mic just slightly. that sound better much better okay yes all right yes should yes. we start over no <laughs> no i i think the people that listen to our podcast know that we are definitely not podcasting professionals <clears throat> as i continue to look at my phone because i'm mentally struggling right now okay so um yeah you've been doing a, a lot but you've coached you've coached for a long time now oh yeah and you have judged for for a decent amount of time now how long have you been judging um the last four years four years and then i would say consistently the last two and that's primarily been in like florida regional kind of you know those events primarily how many how many do you could if you could put a number on how many events not fights but events that you've judged Hmm. is it one a month i could probably do the math if you had told me beforehand i I did not (laughs) I but not. if I would, I would say it's probably between fifty to a hundred judging events. Judging events. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna ask you a question, and you, if you don't want to answer, you don't have to. Sure. Are you? Do you look back now and when you first started and go like, oh, it was terrible, or do you feel like you were somewhat I, okay? I think I was always somewhat okay. I definitely know now I'm better at it. Okay. Um, but also just like everything you do in your life, there's constant education, yeah. constant like. You know the the lessons come fewer and far between, but you still learn. I feel like I have I I coached for a really long time, and now as like a a man in his forties, when I start, I started coaching, when I was in my twenties. Mm-hmm. I look back on some of those early lessons, and I it's like severe cringe. Right. Like I'm just like, oh, I really wish that I wouldn't have taught that. And you know the funny part about coaching is that you'll have an older student that's been with you a long time, mm-hmm. and they'll be like, um, but I remember you taught me that. Yep. And I'll be like, yeah, I just, I, I, I know better now. I did not know better then. Yeah. I, I still have students, like you said, old students, but students who I still train with on occasion. And I see the habit that I had allowed them yeah. to build. And I'm like, ah, I think that's the, I, you know, when it comes to coaching, you know, on, we're kind of segging off from where we should be. But I think that what you kind of nailed that on the head there, which is like habits that you allow to continue Mm -hmm. and then later on i'll see them in my students and be like that's my fault i allowed that to be like a little thing that i should have you know nipped in the butt immediately but i didn't Mm -hmm. so you brought up um pmt yes sir you brought up the ikf and you know i think for the last maybe two years both of us have been doing a lot of different stuff with pmt and with ikf i've been working for you um with the pmt um can you explain kind of what point Muay Thai or point kickboxing or point style is? Absolutely. Okay. So um, when we're talking about point sparring, that's, okay. that's essentially how I would like to also call it. Um, it's that it's that step in between when you're sparring your teammates and fighting strangers in full contact. Now you're more or less sparring strangers. And that's what point Muay Thai is, point kickboxing. Um, We have our different rule sets. There's even point boxing. Um, But essentially, what it really relies on is the semi-contact, no knockout rule that we do not allow finishes. And in that, it does change what some people see it as, as a fight. It's not a real fight. It's not a full contact fight which is what we're accustomed to seeing, which is the amateur and professional fights. It's that step in between. Um, it's a great uh, kind of level. 
I, I always think of um, training as like a stair. Um, so that you have your bag work, pad work, partner drills. Then you build into sparring. Typically, you would build you into probably sparring. should yes. You should build into you probably sparring. should. That's correct. Um, I think we did an episode on sparring. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's still just, up. It's still up. Sparring itself is a complicated ordeal uh, inside the gym um, to keep things safe and to make sure people are actually gaining lessons out of it. Then you go to point sparring, which is now sparring people from other gyms, okay. people you do not know. These are not people you've built a relationship with. On top of that, at our events, we try to make it a little more like an event, a spectacle. So we have an audience. You are being judged. Um, that's where the points come in and you are being presented, uh, awards and such for victories. Okay. All right. Um, you say that, but this, does this count towards like your amateur record? Nope. No. So this is again, a step before amateur. Okay. Fighting. I, I'm going to be honest. Like, I think when, when you approached me, uh, early on about like you were, you had, you had done, um, well, let me not put words in your mouth. How were you exposed to point, um, the point style or point fighting. So I had done some point events when I was an amateur. Okay. Um, when I competed, I just come across them here and there. People would run them and then you just kind of partake. I also did, uh, I don't even want to use the term. <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> yes, I, yeah. I, I, I'm familiar. So, so you did some, some unsanctioned events unsanctioned as well. Fights, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I got you. And so we, when I was teaching, I, would have this like regulated plan on this is what you have to do before you become an amateur, whether it's kickboxing, Muay Thai. Sure. And maybe we had a plan, a route to it, but it was basically jumping from sparring your strangers or I'm sorry, your sparring friends. your friends yeah. to fighting, fighting your strangers, strangers in yeah. front of a large crowd, yeah. typically um, even at smaller events around here in Orlando. It's still a large. Yeah. Crowd. We get, we get big crowds. Yeah. yeah. So um, it can be a little overwhelming. Yeah. You can be the best guy in the room the best amateur in the room, but you've never been exposed to competition like that. There's a, there's a difference between being a, a really skilled technical fighter and being good when you're in a, like um, you have a microscope or a, over top of you basically. Sure, you know? yeah. So I, I get that. And I think anyone who's been training, especially in one gym for a while, you probably have someone off the top of your head like, that guy's so yeah. good. He's the best guy in the room, but he doesn't have the best fight record. And... You know, that could be for uh, multiple uh, reasons. But I think something that's been missing that I got exposed to when I went to, I, I ended up coaching over in Vegas. Okay. And one thing I got exposed to was the Point Muay Thai system they have over in California. Now, this is where the IKF initially started Point Gigboxing and Point Muay Thai. Um, so once I caught wind of that and I started realizing, wow, what a great tool this is to develop our fighters – whether they were MMA guys, Muay Thai, kickboxing, we had something that can really test them before they needed to be ultimately tested in a true fight, an amateur fight. So let's get the like let's get the elephant out of the room right now. This is not start stop point fighting. Yeah, so one of the hardest parts uh explaining point Muay Thai to a lot of these um promote or not promoters, coaches around here is that it's not karate. Okay. That's why I really like to use the term point Muay Thai. Okay. One reason why we use uh, point Muay Thai is because at our events, specifically here in Orlando, majority of the competitors are doing point Muay Thai. Muay Thai, yeah. Of when course. we're talking rule sets, they're doing point Muay Thai. Yeah. PKB is a term that's been around just as long uh -huh. as point Muay Thai, but it's become more synonymous because it was very popular at times in different regions. In California, it's been continuously popular, but it more so evolved into the Point Muay Thai brand there. The other reason uh, why I like to use Point Muay Thai is um, what we were just speaking about beforehand. Yeah. Um, which was... <laughs> we're doing great today, Rich. Um, another reason why I like to use Point Muay Thai. I, 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 it doesn't, what was that? Oh, because when coaches here. Oh, that's why. I got you. I got you. The other reason why I like to use Point Muay Thai is because when coaches who are new to what I'm trying to uh, put yeah. on these events, uh, they hear Point Muay Thai, it sounds different than, than PKB, yeah. which they relate to karate. 
for whatever reason. Okay, fair. And I think that's a historical thing. When both things were going on more popularly, they were more or less side by side. You know, I I, I think that, like, it's hard for me because, like, you don't understand your biases always. Like, you know, I, I don't know why when someone says, like, hey, do you want a Rice Krispie treat? I'm like, yeah. And when someone asks me if I want a scone, I'm like, no. Like, I mean, they're both probably delicious, but, like, your biases are definitely these things that, like, you have these inherent biases that you don't always fully understand. And I think that when, when you initially came to me and you said that um, that you were you were interested in kind of, like, developing the point Muay Thai in, in Orlando, I was like, what are you – like, what is that? And I thought of, like, like uh, Karate Kid, like, first point wins, like, first touch wins, whatever, and – and I think I literally said to you, like, do you have some videos you could send me? Like, what can you show me? Because I don't understand. You know, because at the time I was coaching and I wanted to get my people involved in everything, obviously. But I, I couldn't figure out, like, what that was. And that's pretty much what I had to deal with every coach when yeah. I went around and talked. And there's still coaches in town who I know personally, um, but they still haven't kind of crossed over into trying these events yet. And I think that's just because – they haven't stepped out of that comfort zone of this is what I do to plan for my fighters to go into amateur. And then there we look to build yeah. them into pro and I get it. But also at the same time, just seeing the results from all these guys uh, that have come through the point Muay Thai and how well they're debuting yeah. in their amateur fights. So like we've been doing it now for almost two years and we've seen some of our athletes who started with us now are debuting or even two, three, four fights in as amateurs and they're all doing great doing well yeah. um if they're not winning they're having fantastic performances um it's everyone's looking good yeah i mean i think you know now today when 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 i'm talking about point my tie because i i think i judged the first one and then we've been doing it for two years and i've I mean, how many events have we in total in florida now um, if we include uh, the World Classic, we've probably done 11 events. We 11 just events. had one this past Sunday. Okay, so and then, so I've been involved in like tennis because I was I didn't do the I would World say Classic. Nine or ten for sure. Yeah, and then I know you've worked them. Um, yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. So then, fair. That's fair too. Yeah. So then, if you count count me traveling, yeah. So I mean, I I feel very confident today. Like you know, being able to identify what point Muay Thai is, and maybe. I guess explaining it, although I, I feel like that's usually your job, so I don't really ever have to. Yeah, I mean, the best way it's explained is continuous sparring. So the same thing you do in your gym. There's a time limit. Okay. For adults, we do two minutes. All right. So in that two minutes, the match begins, and two minutes later, that round ends. Okay. Then there's a second round. All right. If it's tie, then we go to a third round. And 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 generally there are some different variations from maybe like different regions, but we're talking specifically kind of like, obviously the Florida region, yeah, very specifically, mm -hmm. and then most of the IKF PMT or PKBs or um, should be very similar. I mm -hmm. guess I w would say I think I think that's something that um, IKF in general is trying to have a very create a very uniformed yeah appearance. Um, so it's. Two minute rounds for adults, right? Which is simulates kind of what an amateur, amateur kickboxing fight. round is, right? Um, you said it's no knockouts, right? So how Correct. do you win? So it's points. Points. Everything is point based. Okay. And to make it as simple as possible, you score points by landing strikes to target areas. Your okay. target areas are your legal uh, spots on the face. Okay. Legal spots on the body, the front, and then we score low kicks, but we only score low kicks above the knee. Okay. Um, why? Above the knee? Yeah. Um, well, as you know, calf kicks are becoming more popular. Sure. Um, and if you're targeting that calf kick, you're probably going to do some damage, whether it's intentional or not. Okay. It's just what happens with that target area. So you're probably going to get warned and possibly DQ'd if it ends up coming too close to hurting the guy. Okay. All right. That would cause a TKO or a knockout. And again, we're no knockouts, no TKO. Yeah. Um, I... What do you think? I guess there's a lot of a lot of ways we could look at this, but what ha do you think the biggest challenge has been for the lot in the last two years for you when it comes to developing this here in Florida? Like we said initially, I would probably say the toughest challenge was explaining it. 
yeah. to coaches before they got to experience it. And even those first couple experiences, we were new at it. Yeah. Um, so we were learning uh, big lessons early on. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> and then um, same thing with the coaches. But now that's less of an issue because now we have coaches who have been with us almost every event. Yeah. And they've really kind of adapted to our standards. It, I Yes. I think that, that it's it's – there have been, unfortunately, there's there's been some gyms that came in that thought it was an amateur fight. Sure. And the, the, that hasn't really been successful for them. And I think they've kind of naturally just, you know, if they're looking for an amateur fight, this is not an amateur fight. This is a learning experience. Yeah. Um, and I think they set the example, like these new gyms. We, we just recently had, at this last event, three gyms who I don't think participated in the past. Okay. And... They got to see what it was, and now you know the coaches come to me and they're saying, "Oh, I get it. Okay, yeah. do you value this more? Okay, I saw this happening yeah, a lot, I, yeah. and it was very valuable, especially for some of these gyms who aren't necessarily Muay Thai based. Maybe they're MMA based, sure, but they get to see the difference in their training compared to what a Muay Thai gym's training is. I I think that you know again, and I'm just. I, I referee, I do a little judging for Point Muay Thai, but you know, when it comes to IKF and it comes to Point Muay Thai, I work for you, right? So um I I'm not speaking, you know, for IKF. I'm not speaking I'm speaking from my perspective of what I've seen. I think early on when we said point, some people thought they were not gonna get hit. Yeah. You're you're still getting hit, mm -hmm. you know? It's it's not we're not punching through the target, but we are touching. Yeah whatever that is, right? And I think I think for me that was the early challenge was trying to explain to people like you know, this is sparring. You're still getting hit in sparring. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like That's what I was saying. It's just like you were in the gym. Yeah. Hopefully you're Ho getting hopefully. punched and hopefully it's just yeah. like it, right? Yeah. Because I think that's the that one of the biggest takeaways I saw early was you could see the gyms that came in that knew how to technical spar, mm -hmm. and you could see the gyms that maybe came in that were like, that were probably you would guess, and I I don't know, I haven't been there, that some gyms were probably sparring way too hard to start off with, yeah, and then they didn't understand that like there's a you know sparring is not fighting, mm -hmm. and fighting is not sparring, right? Um, so that I think that was for me the early challenge was like there's a little nuance there of like, um, hey man, you're still gonna get hit. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you're not you shouldn't be getting hit like to the point that like if that happens to me again, I can't continue fighting. Mm -hmm. But you are gonna get touched up a little bit, you know. Oh yeah. And I think that is a, a misconception, even still, not necessarily from the coaches, but from the new fighters. Sure. Um you know, just a couple of times they'd get caught. And again, it is a gray area and our referees and our officials have to deem, you know, in the moment, Nope, that's a perfectly fine punch. They might've just not have taken it well. Yeah. You know, just they didn't see it coming or something of that aspect that happens in a sparring yeah. match. Um, um, and I think they kind of get shocked by that. Yeah. And it's not because it's a hard punch or anything. It's just, Oh, I didn't know that it like keeps going. Um, but I don't, I don't hold that against the competitor. That's the coach who needs to let them know. It's exactly the same thing. You gotta, you gotta prepare these guys yeah. for that moment. Um, what do you think the biggest surprises for you so far have been? Um, I think just, uh, how well, like I stated before, some of these local coaches, especially the ones here in the Orlando area have adapted to our standards. Yeah. I think. After the first couple, I was just like, ah, you know, there's questions about it. Some teams that I'm, like, expecting to go more towards the technical aspect are going a little too hard. So, you know, but I think each one, we started to see it's kind getting of better. a snowball effect. It's getting better. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that I keep, whenever people ask me about it, the first thing I always say is, like, you should just come to an event. Mm -hmm. The best thing to do is come see an event. Yeah. And that happens so, so uh, frequently in just their past few events that's why yeah. we're getting these new gyms because same thing like i've t every time i've gone to speak to a gym or someone i say even if you don't uh, participate in it i'd love for you guys to come and just watch it that way you yeah. know the next time it's in town if it's something you want to do um 
and like I said, because of these coaches have caught on to the, the, the standards that we try to keep, the fighters are trained, so they have a better understanding of how to win the match. Yeah. So they're doing things more technically sound. So when these coaches come in and check it out, they go, oh, this is what we need to look like if we want to win these matches. Yeah. And ultimately, if you're being technical and you're outscoring your opponent, means you're not getting scored on. Well, when you go to that amateur level, that's the same game plan typically. But now you're already decent at it, if not good at it. Yeah. I th- I think that I'm, I've i made this comment on previous podcasts where um, when I, you know, I would take guys from, um, you know, when I was coaching, uh, I've taken a break from coaching. But when I was coaching, I was coaching kind of like a de- developmental program. Mm-hmm. So a lot of guys that were coming into my gym, had never really thrown a, an educated punch before in their life, right? Sure. They had never really been in, in a competitive fight gym before. And, you know, I was developing them from, you know, coming into class, taking their first class to, you know, six months, a year later, maybe having their first amateur fight. And it occurred to me that a lot of guys that were fighting for me, they would go to their first amateur fight. They'd be so nervous. Mm-hmm. And I would be like, I wonder why this guy's so nervous. You know, obviously he's fighting, you know. But then it also occurred to me that maybe they had never seen Mm -hmm. an amateur fight. Maybe they had never been to an amateur fight. So the crowd, the energy, the, you know, the announcer, the referee, like there's all of these components that you're not used to being a part of. And you go from like sparring in your gym, which hopefully you feel pretty comfortable doing, mm-hmm. to now you're in a, an amateur environment. And oh, by the way, all of my friends and family are here. And if if I lose, I'm gonna I'm gonna be you know zero and one as a fighter. And I started trying to get my guys to just go to fights. Like, can I get my you know my my you know students to like, hey guys, there's gonna be a fight coming up. Let's go watch because if you think you might want to fight in the future, you need to see what this environment is like. Mm-hmm. I like that about the you know Point Muay Thai because you there is a crowd. It's not as probably as big as when you go to a real fight, right? Um, there are judges, there are um, referees, there is an announcer, mm-hmm. so you are getting kind of the um, experience of what it is to fight without necessarily the. Um, without the without the penalty of like if you if you fight and lose, then I got to tell a promoter later on that I'm zero and one or zero and two or whatever it mm-hmm. ends up happening. Um, yeah, when you ask like what lessons or what what surprises I had, that would be the thing was when I first started doing it, I thought okay, this is great for coaches because yeah. again, I was coming mostly from a coaching aspect. This is great for coaches to provide their fighters an opportunity to gain experience. Sure. Um, as I got into it, and once we're getting more and more events, again, especially those initial maybe five, six events, sure. we're learning big lessons, big lessons early on, um, being trained by Johnny, who created uh, Johnny Davis from South Carolina, who created Point Kickboxing, Point Muay Thai when he spent his time over in California. Sure. Um, and that's why it's so popular over there. It was invented in California and then brought over by the same guy who invented yeah. it. So, <laughs> in case y'all didn't know, yeah. um, so one of the big surprises was the amount of lessons that get learned at these events. Um, so obviously the in-fight lessons that a fighter's yeah. having, you know, oh, I need to work on my punch defense or I definitely need to check kicks more. I need more options to escape the clinch. Whether you're winning or learning, right? You're always learning how you apply those lessons. That's on you. That's on your coach. Um, but also just like you were stating, dealing with officials. Yeah. That whole process of checking in, getting weighed in, sitting around. Now we're talking about our rules, like that whole process of fight day. Right. Um, you know what I think is, um, the, (laughs) you know, um, the funniest thing for me was that um, when you're refereeing uh, Point Muay Thai, you're, you're doing a little bit of coaching as well. You know, you'll tell me, hey, I need you to keep your hands up. Hey, listen, um, you know, I need you to calm down a little bit, like simmer down a little bit. Or, you know, um, I, I don't want to say like, you know, you're telling people what to do, but you are kind of giving them like 
heads up and and there's definitely more of a focus on like are both fighters okay yeah right because in in full contact and i've refereed full contact all i really care about is are the rules being followed Mm -hmm. you know and then secondary is like hey this guy's been hit a lot now then i got to start wondering is like is he okay yeah and i think with point muay thai the first kind of thought we're having is are these people okay yeah. Right? Is anything going on that's going to put either of the people in risk? Because we don't want either person to get hurt. Because again, this is not full contact. This is right. semi contact. I think one of the biggest things early on, the surprises, is that I would be kind of like, you know, doing my job as a referee and I would have the fighter start arguing with me. Mm-hmm. And regularly after the fight, I would, I would pull the fighter and the coach aside and I'd say, listen, your coach's job is to argue with me as if necessary. Your job is to try to fight the other guy. Yeah. So if you're spending half the fight arguing with the referee, that's not your job. Like you're you're wasting half of your time on the wrong job. Mm-hmm. And that hasn't happened a lot lately. But I think the first year, I would get a lot of times the 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 fighters would wouldn't necessarily like whatever, and they would start trying to like argue with me about it. And I'd be like, look, you you got to trust your coach is going to argue if necessary. Like yeah. you don't need. And I see that in full contact. Where and, and this is an issue that, as a coach, um, I implemented, but I guess not all coaches implement this. Sure. But maybe that's from my experience as a competitor. Was in training, I would try to implement how a referee sure. would, you know, yell at you for breaking that rule, or yeah. or putting you to a neutral corner, or if you get hit in the nuts, not letting you take a break, continue yeah. the fight, which are things that are almost only experienced when you're in an actual fight yeah um those aren't the funnest parts those aren't the most entertaining parts of a fight but as a competitor those are important lessons to learn i mean like in 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 our last you know full contact match one of the guys lost his mouthpiece Mm -hmm. probably ill-fitting mouthpiece right it wasn't like he was hit hard i want to make that clear he lost his mouthpiece i think because he he just was he was kind of like chewing on it and it fell out it slipped out of his mouth you know and you know as you always see fighters do, he went to grab his mouthpiece instead of defending himself. Luckily, the other guy was it's semi contact. He did wasn't hitting him hard. You know, the the ref stopped it and they're like, hey, you know, well, let's get your mouthpiece. But you know, those are lessons that it's much better to learn in a semi contact environment than to learn in a full contact environment. Because you and I have both seen guys that in full contact that have lost their mouthpiece and gone for it. Oh yeah. And, well, and we, take pits for it. We really expressed it a lot this last uh, event, but we've talked about it every event. It's part of what we're looking for, which a lot of fighters, beginner fighters especially, but we've seen it at the highest level about keeping your, your face to your opponent at all times. Don't turn your back. Do not Don't turn, turn your, your back. back. And this gets expressed a lot in the gym, and your teammates are taking care of you. So if you do end up turning your back, you don't get paid for it often. Yeah. But in a competitive realm... This is going to happen. If you turn your away and you get hit, yeah. it's going to hurt a lot more. We all know this. The shots you don't see coming are the ones that hurt the most. So we stress that a lot at our events, yet we see time and time again. But again, because our referees are aware of this, they're going to coach a little more. They're going to stop it before there's an opportunity. Yeah. But we will warn fighters, and we could also DQ them because they're not protecting themselves. Yeah. I think that's actually a good a good um, thought on when it comes to like a, a difference. If my fighter turns away in a semi contact fight, I'm I'm almost immediately going to step in and tell the dude to turn back around. Mm-hmm. In a full contact fight, if he turns away, sure. you know, as long as it's a legal shot, I'm kind of like, well, uh, that wasn't a great idea, my man. You yeah. know, like, and I've had fighters when I was coaching that in full contact, for their first full contact fight. Did not understand that even though in sparring I had stressed over and over again, face your opponent, face your opponent, face your opponent. But, you know, how often do you get broke by a ref until you're in a full contact fight? Yeah. What does that even mean? I mean, what is you've been there as the ref. What is more awkward than a fighter who doesn't understand neutral corner? Yeah. They're just yeah. running around the ring, yeah. being chaotic. Going to talk to the crowd and stuff. You're like, no, I can't even do my job. Yeah, man. and now you got them talking to their coaches. Yeah, neutral and, corner, man. Yeah. But they haven't been taught that, maybe. Not taught that. But if they've done... Ex- they uh, haven't been taught that. If they've been experienced a point Muay Thai match, yeah. they would have learned that pretty They're quick. now starting to yeah. get that yeah. kind of idea. And that gets introduced to them at a level... Again, it's... Any competition is going to be high pressure. 
but it's at a level where the pressure's eased off a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I and I, you can s- probably learn a lot easier than <sighs> and because I I've been there in high stress fights. It's hard to pay attention to all those details, even post fight. Yeah, you go, what happened? I have no idea what happened. How do of I course, learn if course, I don't remember? Yeah. The adrenaline's a, a hell of a drug. You I've know? I've uh, I've cornered uh, fights where. Um, Myself, my assistant corner, and the fighter all disagreed about what actually happened in a moment. Mm-hmm. We all, all three of us had a different, a different, complete, uh, this is how it happened. And we all had to go back and watch the video together and be like, oh, and all three of us were wrong. Yeah. And that's what I love. You watch the video, and this is what I tell guys all the time. You need to be watching video, yeah. and you need to be filming. Even at our events, anytime I get a complaint, you know, I'll sit there, probably talk to him for too long. But I'll sit there and talk to the coaches or the parents or the fighter even. Sure. Hey, this is what I experienced. Do you have video? If Because the video yes. doesn't lie. Yeah, yeah. The video never lies. This is... And we all learn from it. And that's where we get – if there's just word of mouth, then it's just a gray area of yeah. he said, she said. This is – yeah, this is one of those things where it's like even as a as a ref, you know, being able to watch that video and go, okay, yeah, I, see, I see why I missed that. Or – Man, I shouldn't have missed that. You know, like, well, oh, I was in the wrong position or whatever. Even as a judge, I've rewatched fights that I knew were close, so I yeah. wanted to go back and watch them and be like, did I make the right was call? I, was I the wrong person for this? <sighs> but it's, you know, in judging, when we get an episode on that, yeah. um, you can only score what you see. Sure. So what you're literally able to see is what you believe happened. And in moments when you're refing or even when you're competing um, or even judging – Things happen, and in your mind, they happen this way. Yeah. But we're already on the next moment, and then the next moment, so and the next. I let me pull you back there, um, and let's talk a bit about judging. How are the the point Muay Thai fights judged? So How does that work? Let's say we're doing point Muay Thai rules. Okay. So what we allow in point Muay Thai is punches, kicks, and knees. Okay. Um, punches and kicks can go to the head, the body, and of course, you can kick the legs. And then knees can go to the body, and knees can go to the legs. Okay. We score any strike that lands. Okay. So if a punch lands clean to the head or body, we're scoring that. If a kick lands to the head, body, legs, we're scoring that. All right. Same thing with the knees. As long as they're landing, they're not being checked, they're not being blocked, they're not being uh, made miss, as long as they make contact. So the amount of force you throw does not change how we score. Sure. If anything, I also uh, I will tell my judges, if someone is being – too aggressive, meaning the ref is having to warn them. Sure. They're, they're throwing too hard. If they're being warned, those are strikes we don't count. Okay. So even though they're making contact, and unfortunately they're making harder contact than what we want to see, we want to make sure those aren't being counted for. All right. Um, is there a um, – and I, I guess I know some of these things, but I, I want to – You're trying to about, act from like – the third what the person. what the person listening will be um is it is the judge's score written down no no uh, it's it's to our judges uh in the moment um obviously there's a lot of matches going on okay uh, just recently i think we had like something like 64 or so okay. matches so we don't want to sit there pen and paper all the matches um it's basically at the end of each round our ref will go to the center of the ring they'll ask for the judge's call the okay. judges will point to either corner All right. based on who they thought scored the most points. So this is open scoring. Open scoring. So as a, as a as a athlete as the coach, you know between rounds kind of where you're at. Correct. Which and is different than your average uh, amateur sure, or professional fighter. Sure. But I mean I think if you're a good coach, you should have a general idea. Sometimes it doesn't always work out. We all know that. And I think there's a lot of misconception on the judging okay. on our part. And I think that's just because a lot of us are just exposed to full contact fights so much. Okay. So, um, you know, some guys really favor an aggressive uh, fight style. Okay. So they're just very aggressive. But if those shots aren't landing clean, we're not counting for that. And we're not accounting for effective aggressiveness. We're literally looking to who scores the most points. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then obviously if you defend a technique correctly, that would not be considered a yeah, score. No, yeah. no score. Um, and, and also it's not like someone's running out and just spamming, you know, 
five, 10, 15 punches in a row. It's not like that. This is this is what you yeah. what any Muay Thai fight looks like. We we really encourage the Muay Thai techniques. Okay. Uh, one thing that I mentioned or did not mention in the scoring is we score dumps and sweeps as well. Okay. So um, as long as you're scoring a strike to a legal target and you're making the attempts for sweeps and you're scoring sweeps, you're scoring dumps, as long as they're legal, we're scoring those yeah. as well. And obviously then clinch is allowed. Mm -hmm. okay. And we put a favor on Muay Thai techniques. So okay. What I try to get my judges to, and this is where it's tough because sometimes you do get guys who want to fight more of a punch style. Sure. Maybe that's where they're finding the most success in that moment. But if they're being too punch happy, they're just head hunting, you know, the last 20 strikes they've thrown have been punches to the head. We're going to warn them, hey, mix it up a little bit more because it looks like you're trying to hurt the guy, right? It, even they can be throwing point style, but they're just being hyper aggressive on one side. So. We do want to favor the Muay Thai techniques. Uh, not to say kicks score higher, but we are going to favor a fighter who is throwing more kicks than the other guy. If we're both equal on punches, but I have a few more kicks over you, I'm probably going to I'm, I'm probably winning that round. Nice. Um, same thing with knees to the body. And I, I encourage uh, scoring punches to the head the least amount. Punches to the body, knees to the body, kicks to the body, kicks to the legs, knees to the legs. I like to put a favor on those. Okay. Again, that's going to be for a developmental standpoint. As a coach and as a fighter, you're going to want a fighter who mixes up the targets. This goes into when we do an episode on finishing fights. <laughs> sure. <laughs> there's a science to it. And part of that science is uh, targeting other areas of the body to open up that knockout. Shot. Sure. So sure. obviously we do not allow knockouts, but as a developmental standpoint, we want our athletes, as they go into the amateur and professional realms, we want them to get knockouts. I think that's one of the things that like, you and I have talked about heavily is that essentially we're trying to – yes, we love seeing the same guys over and over and over again, but ultimately we're hoping that the guys that come in and compete for us move on to bigger and better things, right? Yeah. And I think that's been one of the, one of the things that maybe – separates us a little bit just when it comes to like where we fall on the spectrum of like competitive fighting because our goal really is to graduate people to that next level where you know they're going to full contact fights whether that's with ikf or with any organization mm -hmm. you know we have um i recently learned we have 13 different essentially organizations that do amateur fighting in florida Right, so we've had guys now that are graduating and moving on to those other organizations to fight in amateur competition, and and like you said earlier, I I do see them doing well, which is is awesome, you know. But um, what's the feedback been like from coaches? Oh, coaches love it. Yeah. Um, honestly, I've even even coaches who you know, if you were to compare their experiences to other coaches on a certain event, even coaches who are having quote unquote a less good experience are still loving it because yeah. again it, it's it's pointing them in a direction of how they should be treating their training um it's it's been nothing but great uh feedback one of my favorite things is to see returning coaches yeah it it, it speaks wonders because again as someone who comes from a coaching background if i like the promotion my fighters are in they're going to get my loyalty yeah and as they grow and we grow with them it, it, it kind of becomes like a synergy uh, relationship, sure, right? Sure. Synergetic. And it's really nice, too, to see them take the lessons they learned from our event, apply them. Now we're getting fighters out of some of these gyms that, you know, they're going, they're like, you know, I think traditionally speaking, any guy who is debuting nowadays, amateur, looks better than a debuter five years ago. Oh, 100%. Ago. We've, we've had this conversation before. Yeah. Where it's like the quality of debut fighter today. It gets insane. It's insane. But now I'm seeing it in our region, some of these, uh, specifically these Muay Thai guys, uh, these kickboxers, when they make their debut, they're not just looking good for a debuter. They look great already. Yeah. They look like they've been doing more experience. and. That's not every athlete who participates. I don't want to say like we have some miracle drug and we make yeah, everyone no, better no, no, no. and you know, but what that is You still have to do the work. Yeah. And what that is is coaches taking those lessons learned and applying them to the training. You can learn a thousand lessons, but if you never applied them, you never get I better. think also too for the average coach, when you go to competition, that's really where you see like, well, this might be a problem. Yeah. And if this is a problem for him, it might be a problem for a lot of people. Absolutely. And now it's like there's guys that 
you know, we've all had that guy in the gym where you're like, man, he might be good in competition, but he might be a, a disaster. And I think that the PKB, PMT, Point Muay Thai is a good place for you to be like, let me see, let me see if this if this person can put it together, you know, like yeah. And then also, again, if there's glaring, if there's an issue on one guy, that's probably an issue that you need to address. Yeah, across I the mean, board. I think it's a life lesson. What's good for the goose is good for the gander, right? We've all heard that, and I think that a hundred percent comes up in competition. Yeah, and this is something I say in our rules meeting. Um, make sure you guys take these lessons back to your gym. Train them with your other teammates. Yeah. Because this is how true development comes into place. I know everything I've learned has come from other people's experiences on top of my own. Yeah, of course. But it's not just my own. I'm grabbing from my coaches, my teammates, uh, fighters from other gyms, professional guys on podcast. Like, you're learning from so many people. What better way to learn it firsthand from a guy who just experienced it on Sunday? Yeah. Um, And that's where, when I point out... uh. I'm again, I'm still a coach at heart. So I look at everything as a competition. Now (laughs) I'm very competitive. So I look at one, first and foremost, my team, my team needs to be the number one team. That's how I always look at it. If if you're a coach and you're not thinking that way, you know, something's wrong. Maybe you have a healthy, well-adjusted mental state. (laughs) (laughs) My team's number one. Okay. If my team's number one or they're not i at least want my region to be number one yeah and now okay my region's number one or it's not well at least my state is number one and that's how i look at it so i really want florida to succeed and i look at something i actually wrote it in my second notebook uh this is just something i looked at a couple weeks ago um the wbc rankings sure okay this is their professional rankings and it went by Every division, they just put it out. If you go to their Instagram, scroll back. This a is like quick. their pound for pound. Yeah, like their top 10 or top 15 rankings for their division. Sure. So I went through and I, I kept track of each state that's being represented. And I kind of made it a goal in my head to, through our efforts, and obviously there's so many other promotions and and uh, coaches and people in the area that are constantly looking to grow the sport, grow their athletes. But I think our contribution is going to be one of those things that can accelerate it. So I look at the WBC rankings, and I'm just going to go down uh, number one to number five. These are by state and by how many fighters. So number one is California with 18 fighters. New York is number two with eight. Texas, number three with six fighters. Massachusetts (laughs) is number four with five fighters. And then at number five, the three-way tie for three fighters is Arizona, Colorado, than Florida. Ugh. So I look at that and I say, okay, we're number five in the country. But if you add those other two that are tied with us, I'm going to look at it as we're like number eight. Okay. And the reason why I say that is because those two states have less people than us. Per capita. Per capita. Per capita. We're, we're getting our butts kicked. Now, California with 18, they have the highest population. Okay. 39 million people in California. Okay. They have 18 fighters. So for every 2 million people, there's one fighter that's ranked. Okay. If we did that for Florida, 22 million people, for every 2 million people, how many should we have ranked? (laughs) I think I can math. (laughs) It's about seven. Seven. It's around seven. It's like 7.15 or something. So we should have at least the number three spot. All right. All right. We should knock Texas off. So you're trying, to, you're trying to – just so the official record is you're trying to knock Texas off is what you're saying right I'm now. I'm taking Texas yeah, off. Okay, well, with Texas, be aware you're, you're on the path. Now, recently, <laughs> in the last year or so, the IKF PNT has gone to Texas. Yeah, I saw so that. So they're kind of correlated. Uh, okay. So that is – in my mind, Texas is our number one enemy. Now, California is <laughs> at the top. California is number one, and they've been doing it for a long time. Okay. And again, like we were saying before – what is it? Causation does not equal correlation, or uh, cor- correlation is not causation. And I even asked for the. Uh, but that's that's what. So California has been doing point muay thai for about twenty five, twenty six years, something around there, and they have the most fighters. Of course, they have the most populated state, but they have it at such a higher rate. And I I don't necessarily again want to say that's because of point muay thai. I feel. But that. I think there's a without question a higher rate of competition over there, a higher focus on Muay Thai in that state. And uh, again, the fact that Florida's has three 
speaks to our talent. I think we have some of the best uh, coaches and some of the best fighters in all combat sports, including Muay Thai. I just think they haven't had the development programs that are going to really accelerate and, and push their fighters. Muay Thai. Yeah. That's fair. Um, oh. Mic drop. Mic drop. Taking out Boom. Texas. Uh, Good thing I have no friends in Texas. I think, I, I mean, everyone's got a friend in Texas. Somebody in Texas just wrote your name down like Rich Grindle. <laughs> My family's from Texas. Must die. <laughs> My mom and other members are from Texas. Oh, that is that is a... Uh, so, uh, point point style, point Muay Thai. There are other people doing it. There are other organizations doing it. Um. Yeah, I mean, if they use that term. Okay. Uh, sometimes they use other terms. What we use is point Muay Thai. Okay. Technical competition. Uh-huh. Semi-contact. Okay. No knockout. Okay. Every flyer you see with an IKF, PKB, PMT um, I'm gonna, logo. Let's look at your shirt. That logo on your shirt right there? Yeah, that logo. Okay. All right. With the fighters on the side. Okay. Um, Every flyer you see with that is going to have those terms on it. Now, other flyers should not have the IKF logo if they're ran by another promotion. Yeah. Um, but it might say semi-contact. It might okay. say point style. Yeah. You know, people go by other things. Um, one thing we are most definitely not is a smoker. Okay. So if you hear anyone use that term, we're not associated. We're out. We're out. Yeah. Um, I do have, because it is newer here um, in recent years, the point kickboxing, point Muay Thai. I do have coaches and fighters reach out to me asking. If it's are, a smoker. If, if this is our event. And normally, okay. Are you the, mean like other events? You yeah. Know? And uh, normally I just say if it's not posted on our Instagram yeah. We're not a part of it. Uh, and then, or the website, obviously. Right? Yeah, yeah, you can okay. check out the website, FloridaIKFPNT.com. Um, what separates us from some of these other events, do you think? Um, Is that a fair question? Yeah. Yeah. I would, say, I would say what separates us, as I was mentioning earlier, how old the IKF PKB is. Okay. How long it's been around. And we were trained by Johnny Davis, who is the inventor of it okay uh, no one was really doing point kickboxing and then that later quickly evolved into point muay thai um before johnny sure so he started over in california so we're learning from the source and he's had over 20 years to develop it and to make it as it is now on top of that the network that we have with the rest of the ikf promoters um one thing i love about working with the ikf is there's a lot of transparency there's a lot of communication And the world of martial arts, as we were talking about before the martial arts industry, I feel like there's a a missing gap in a lot of relationships. Yeah. Um, You know, just working with inside gyms, working with teams, there's not always the best communication. There's not always the transparency we all want. Yeah, that's fair. But with the IKF, I, I feel a great deal of that. And I can call any of the other promoters. I can ask for advice. They're not trying to keep secrets. We all wanted to see... The IKF and the sport of Muay Thai, successful. more importantly, grow and be successful. I think that I, I've said this to you a couple of times off the air, but I think it's important to say on the air. You know, one, it's like I, I, you know, I knew there'd be no way for us to get through a whole episode without saying Johnny Davis. Um, you know, I think that you know, obviously Johnny Davis today is the vice president of IKF. He is, you know, hint, he is. Um, kind of like the the leading the charge on the east coast of the united states definitely to grow ikf now we have ikf in the midwest we have ikf in texas so we are we are like you know obviously ikf's always been in california right or as long as you know muay thai has been around ikf's probably been in california yeah um you know the there's a with our organization there's a lot of accountability so if you make a a mistake and mistakes happen you're gonna have to explain that later probably Mm -hmm. And I think that some of the horror stories that we hear from some of these other, like, let's call them semi-contact events that are not sanctioned by ICAF are, are you know, things that would definitely not fly within our organization. You yeah. know, straight up. Um, and that's kind of, you know, we have a lot of oversight. You know, whether it's, you know, I, you know, if I'm at an event, you know, I'm I'm working as a safety official, essentially, right? I call so, you my safety specialist. <laughs> safety specialist. Um, you know, but then typically that means that you're, you know, overseeing me. I'm overseeing a bunch of these people. You know, we have... We have a lot of eyes on everything. A lot of eyes, right? Yeah. And then also, you know, people are filming. 
right? So if if there's which I tell them even in yeah. the rules meeting, guys, I encourage to film it, yeah. film it, and listen. I know a hundred percent that if we make a mistake at one of our events, everyone's going to find out about it within the IKF, right? So I don't want, I don't want that to happen. You know, I wanted to have clean, great events. You know, and I think some of the the issues that you see in some of these other organizations are just because they're they're not. They don't have that oversight. Yeah. You know, like we have a lot of oversight. I think another advantage or difference, whatever you want to call it, uh, that I feel I can't prove anything. Sure. But, you know, I'm opinionated and this is how I feel is uh, the guys I get like you, my refs, my judges, um, people, everyone on every side that's involved is extremely passionate yeah. about what we do. And we're extremely passionate about martial arts in general. Yeah. I have a lot of guys who do MMA, who do jiu-jitsu, to where you may be surprised they care so much about the Muay Thai fighters. For sure. And it's really, uh, I think that's something that separates us. Not only the accountability from the IKF, we know we're going to hear something from those guys. And that's what I want. I like that. That's how a team succeeds. But also, I know I go home and everyone involved in any situation that we may deem like, you know, not ideal for our, our standards. Yeah. It bothers us. I know I've been on the phone with you oh, for of course. hours of course. over something as simple as should we call it a no contest? Yeah. Or or was that a DQ? Sometimes uh, what frustrates me is that, you know, um is a parent will be upset about something and I'll be like I've spent a lot of time talking to you about like, hey, what what how do we make that situation right or did we do the right thing? Mm-hmm. Like what is going to be the best thing? You know, because again, I think we're not, you know, I don't think either of us look at it as like we're holding an event for like, it's not a show. It has the elements of a show, right? There's, there's, there's music and there's a crowd and there's, you know, um, an announcer, but really I think that we both look at it as an educational tool for us to develop athletes. Yeah. And I think that sometimes we struggle when it's like, wow, I feel like we didn't like, we got to make this situation right for this person. Or I think that the thing that I struggle with the most of is like, this was a great event, but I want the next event to be even greater. Yeah. Or this was a safe event. I want the next event to be even safer. You know, yeah. and in our two years of doing these, we have had very little injury. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I would say we, we have gotten better at that too. I yeah. think early on, uh, we had a couple things that are a little more preventable that we definitely kind of nipped in the butt after we've had yeah. some, you know, unfortunate things. But, you know, with with any contact sport, we all know if you've played any other sport besides martial arts, there is a lot of room for error. Yeah. And as safe as we try to make it, you have to realize this is martial arts. This is sure, fighting. Sure, sure, sure. So sure. even though we're sparring and it's technical and this is not meant to have a knockout, you're still dealing with people. Yeah. And you're dealing yep, with people course. who – you know, their intentions may be good or their intentions may be bad. You yeah. don't know until they make an action. Sure. And those actions, again, as long as they're playing by the rules, will be safe and the, the match continues, the yeah. ref is less involved. But if you're going against what we call, you know, necessary actions, then we're we're going to yeah. get a lot more involved, step in a lot more, make it less of what is intended. One thing I would like to point out is we intend, because we said this earlier about, like, the development process of how we score will kind of teach you and and direct you in a way where you can learn how to knock someone out, learn how to finish a fight. Our goal is to not have knockouts, not have anyone get hurt in a fight. We may ask you to to chill on certain weapons that are just being too effective. Sure. So that also teaches you to adjust, um, change your weapons and stuff like that. But also what it helps us learn to do is is go to decision. Um, like we, we spoke on open scoring before. Sure. And that's such a vital tool, I think, because a guy will see that their fighter lost round one. Now they must make these adjustments. Adjustments. Or you don't get to see a yeah. third round. And okay. I love when they go to third rounds. So, um, I, I guess that's a good point. So, you know, uh, one corner wins the first round. The other corner wins the second round. Mm-hmm. So then there is a third round. Yeah. Yeah. And it really kind of, um, I think it motivates fighters to come back. They they don't they don't have any other option if they want to continue. There's no knockout. Oh, I go knock them out in the third. I let them get tired. This sure. is, that, that strategy is no longer 
Okay. An option. I'm not going to wear him down. I can only win by decision, yeah. and I'm down a round. The only way I'll win is if I continue to outscore this guy. Sure, sure. Um, I think that I th- did. Did you? We go through all the stuff that we wanted to go through. I think that covers yeah. a lot of it. I mean, there's so much we could talk about. Yeah. Um, you know, if if I were to say anything to like coaches or athletes who are thinking about doing the point Muay Thai, again, speak with other coaches, maybe who have experienced it, get their feedback. You don't have to talk to me. Of course, I'm going to say nothing but great things about it. But I think you're going to hear the same thing from coaches. And if all else, just come and, you know, check out a show. Maybe just send an assistant coach to come check out a show. This is a good point. Um, that I Something that I've been seeing a little bit of lately, too, that I like. Some of the coaches now that have had multiple, that have been with us for two years, now I'm starting to see like they they'll bring in an assistant coach mm-hmm. or they'll bring in a fighter they to take a step back to be and then and they're taking an opportunity to kind of step back. They're, you know, a lot of them are still there, they're still in the room, but they're just kind of like letting, you know, um, some of their fighters actually you know work on being corners and you know you know some of the more senior students yeah. work on that. And I think that's also a great great tool because i know a lot of guys that the first time they corner and for a full contact fight they are terrified oh yeah you know so like i get i still to this day it just happened a couple months ago this guy i trained in vegas he had trained maybe 15 years prior to meeting me sure so he's only my student for like three years but uh i cornered him in his fights and he called me a few months ago and goes coach i really need advice i'm cornering my guys my first time cornering i'm so scared yeah. And I'm like, go pee wait beforehand. I was like, you're cornering. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, dude, you're just as experienced as I am. You've been doing this sport just as long as I have. Uh, you're good. Here's some, some basic calls. Here's some basic cues. You're going to figure it out. You've been there before. And, you know, but had he had gotten a little experience, had it not yeah. been a guy that's like a professional fighter that he's like terrified of ruining this guy's yeah. career, he would have already understood what his role is and, and how yeah. I don't want to say simple it is, because it's not simple if you're the head coach. But if sure. you're not the head coach, cornering's not. I mean, rocket we could make science. this. We could make this argument a lot, but I think if you're a great coach, by the time you get to the point of cornering, you're really just like carrying the bags and making sure that your fighter can continue. And we can yeah. talk about that more later on. But it's Absolutely. not like you should have done most of the work. Yeah. Already, your your athletes and they're making yeah. decisions. The thing that I hate more than ever anything on earth is when I see like. Um, two coaches trying to pantomime out to like the <laughs> fighter, like, nah, I need you to grab him like this. Like, oh, this is a bad time to be explaining this. But um, that, that, that coaching thing, uh, what it, you asked earlier about like surprised me. And again, I said the, the lessons that are taught outside of just the in fight uh, lessons. Yeah. That's one of them is, is coaches now get to learn about this athlete. This athlete gets to learn what their coach is like in a competitive se- setting. The coach now has their assistant taking a lead. Um, now that assistant's starting to see what the sure. coach does. So it's a learning process with everyone involved. My officials, everyone that works with me does something else in the fighters community. You know, I work close with uh, Mitchell from Combat Night and Jada from Submission Grappling Series. And everyone that works for those shows, um, a lot of those guys work for me as well. And then... That helps them get better at their job for those shows. Our sure, jobs, sure. Our jobs get better because they're out there getting their reps in. My IKF ref is over here getting his reps in. Yes, it's point style, but he's still to the neutral corner. He's still, you know, yeah. doing the beats that you're supposed to do. I, I dare not say this, but I think that refing point Muay Thai is actually you need to be a bit of a better. You have to be a bit of a better ref sometimes because sometimes when you're when you're coaching full contact. If if the two guys know what they're doing, or the two girls know what they're doing, if the two, two people fighting know what they're doing, you're just kind of sitting there and watching. Yeah. To some extent, you know, with point, there's a it's a bit more um, more work, more mm-hmm. stuff that needs to be aware of. Um, okay, so a couple of things. When is your next event here in Florida? Uh, our next event is September 16th in Jacksonville. Okay, where is that at? That's going to be at Smiley Academy. And if I wanted to um, sign up for that event, that would be the Florida. IKFPMT.com. Correct. We'll put a link on the show notes. Um, and then our next Orlando show is October 15th uh, at Orlando Taekwondo and Kung Fu, okay. like it's been the last previous events. And that is the same website, Florida, IKFPMT.com. Yep. You can also check out our Instagram at 
Florida underscore IKF. I'm sorry. Florida <laughs> underscore PKB underscore PMT. I hope, I hope that is right. Should we double check yeah, that? Yeah, double check yeah, that. Yeah, let's double check that real quick. And if you guys are at home, you guys could also double check that if you really wanted to. Um, it is. We've got to get better at that for sure. I'll learn. Florida, I need to get better at it. Florida underscore PKB underscore PMT. Um, we'll, we'll have that linked as well. Obviously, if you're more interested in listening to more of the podcast, that is linked on um, combattheory.com or wherever podcasts are found, uh, along with YouTube, if you've been listening um, on Spotify or YouTube or, or uh, Apple Podcasts or whatever. Uh, you could also watch us um, kind of pushing buttons in, in you know, live in the living color on our YouTube channel. Um, visit our one of our sponsors, which is uh, impactmouthguards.com. And if you use code combat theory, you get uh, a bit of a savings and we get a few dollars to help pay for this obsession. Um, what are we talking about in our next episode, Rich? I think uh, we wanted to highlight judging. Judging. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to talk all about judging, your experience judging. Rule of, sets. and Rule sets. Scoring I, criteria. I get a lot of people that are asking um, on on my uh, Instagram, like how to get involved in that. So we'll, we can talk about that as well. Kind sure. of where do we start? Yeah. We'll try and tackle as much yeah. of that aspect of the sport as we can. So then also, if you listen to this episode and you have questions about coaching or you have questions about whatever, feel free to, you know, contact myself or uh, contact Rich. Um, and maybe we can address your um, concerns on our next podcast. Thank you guys so much. Have a beautiful day. Thanks, Rich. Thank you.